What have we learned about blast, head injury, blast in terms of the head injury? There is, um, and I, there's a lot that we've learned in terms of um, science. Uh, and what, what I mean by science is, is the physics of the blast. Uh, today, I know more about, you know, P, uh, P10 explosives and uh, shock waves than I ever knew when I was in graduate school. I didn't think that was even going to be a, a topic of interest for a neuroscientific community. So we learned a lot. Is it applicable to what's happening in Iraq and Afghanistan? Uh, there are, there seems to be two big camps out there. One is that the, um, and I'm overstating this probably a bit or simplifying it a bit, but there's a camp that says that these blast head injuries are very unique. It's a whole new set of an injury. And from a scientific point of view, and in uh, an odd way, that's really fun because that means we have a whole new injury to study. In a humanitarian way, this is a real, really problematic because we're making the same recommendations to the military about blast concussions that we've made to the National Football League. And maybe things are different and maybe we're giving them the wrong information if it's completely a different injury and it doesn't have any of the other characteristics. There's another camp of our science that believes that it's not that unique. It is different in terms of the biomechanical events that occur that move the head or shake the head or but the actual injury itself is pretty common it's similar to what we've actually seen in other and other types of concussions that being said the mechanism by which blast produces a concussion has also has very different types of theoretical basis and people are trying to study some people think that because of the armament that people have now and the exposure of the types of blasts that they get, that this is from a thoracic concussion that causes a wave that goes up and hurts the brain. Then there's a theory that the wave, the pressure wave, and then the best way to think about it is if you're underwater in your home swimming pool and somebody shouts at one end, you can hear this wave that goes across. And they think that this wave actually penetrates the helmet and penetrates the skull, and that's what causes the injury. And then there's another group that says, you know, all it is, it's just like being hit with a, a tsunami of a air blast. And it has an overpressure and an underpressure, much like being pushed in to shore and drug out afterwards. And that what this does is just thus violently moves the head back and forth or rotates it the same way that you would in a boxing match or a football match, and that's what causes the concussion. The uh, curious problem in terms of trying to apply these types of theories or models to the blast head injury is that pure blast head injury is very rare in Iraq and Afghanistan. It's always a blast, plus you get thrown and hit your head, or it's an, it's an MRAP uh, vehicle that gets blown up and you have uh, horrible burns. And at um, UCLA, where we have Operation Mend, a lot of the individuals will come through BAMC, Brooks Army Medical Center for burns, and when they come up to UCLA for their reconstructive surgery, we'll do the scans for their brain injury. And the, the injuries look pretty much what I've seen in car accidents or other types of injuries. They've just been misdiagnosed. They didn't even think to look, but they're there. And so, and they've been treating them for multiple sclerosis, or they've been treating them for psychiatric disorders, and they don't have psychiatric disorders, they have a brain injury and they need to go into rehab. Or, uh, so there's a, um, we've, learned, we've, we've learned to focus on this, and there are lots of models, uh, both tissue and animal models that people are addressing in terms of utilizing this. We don't at UCLA. But, um, and it has potential that this may be able to be transferable. But um, we, we won't know for a long time, I don't think. Um, wh what I think is going to happen is that there's a lot of engineers that are trying to come up with the right kind of biomarkers to determine if you've had a blast concussion. And there are also of some very neat engineers in nanotechnology using dosa dosometers that individuals could wear either on their, either on their protective gear 
or inside the helmet or next to the skin to determine how much of a wave they've actually been exposed to or, or, or a, a pressure wave or under pressure wave. The treatment, <coughs> excuse me, for these individuals that have had these types of injuries in Iraq and Afghanistan acutely after brain injury by a medic or a corpsman is a big challenge because they're already carrying over 150 pounds of, of uh, equipment. And uh, tourniquets are actually more important in terms of acute care than monitoring concussion in, in the battlefield. So it's, it, it's not that it, it doesn't have the right priority, but the way we learn about a disorder or about a blast injury is to find a brain that has a blast injury and either take it out after the individual dies and see what it looks like and try to model that or we image it very closely as soon as it occurs or, uh, um, or after it occurs and tries to see what, what it looks like and see what sort of signature characteristics it has. And this year Admiral Mullen uh, ordered the first implementation of deployment of MRIs in Iraq and Afghanistan. And actually we're going to put them all in, I guess they're going to put them all in Afghanistan now. And there was a lot of resistance for that. They didn't want them there. Why? Um, I don't know. I don't, but there was a lot of resistance to have that type of imaging in Afghanistan.